Good morning, everyone. I'm glad to have you here and delighted, uh, absolutely thrilled to um, welcome you to this um, hybrid event, hybrid webinar hosted live here out of Maputo, Mozambique and online. And um, focusing on the topic of risk management, crisis management, and how the tools and methodologies of uh, measurement can actually support and assist PR and communication professionals to get the right way to understand and track the way their work is being implemented, the results and the outputs of that work, but also, and most important, the outtakes and outcomes, how it impacts in reality the end goal of your uh, work. So this event um, is organized by PRCA Africa and by Karma. Uh, my name is Philippe, I'm from Karma, media intelligence company, and we hope that this event will allow you that are uh, with us online and here live to take a little bit of the experiences and point of view of those that we've invited and I'm sure you'll be delighted to meet, if not already uh, know them by, by now. So um, to start with and to introduce, of course, if we talk about reputation management, um, risk management and crisis management, we need to look into how best to plan our approach to, in, uh, to, to each one of those um, um, assets and um, uh, uh, activities. Although in order to do so, we need to bear in mind that we need to have the data we need to work that data and we need to identify the stakeholders, key messages, channels, and again, know how to track and measure the way they are really implemented. I would um, refer one of the studies that have been recently published. It was put together by PRCA Africa and APRA, the African Public Relations Association. It has been published quite recently and you probably came across already. And I would highlight two conclusions that I think are most relevant for the topic today. One of them is that out of the all of the respondents, pretty much a quarter of them, 25% or 26%, um, uh, referred that they don't use any methodology whatsoever in terms of me measurement. Therefore, it means that they, the way they are left is to believe they are doing a good work and they really don't have any structured way to approach the end up result. Now, other than that, I would say that uh, approximately 50% refer using other metrics or other methodologies, for example, ABEs, advertising value equivalency, and we know pretty much by now, everyone knows a little bit the lack of um, objectivity that that has, or impressions, or even the PESO uh, model, uh, paid, earned, shared, owned media. Now, those metrics and uh, the way we look at those, if they are not integrated and correlated with the communication objectives, of course, that will be just simply a, an incomplete way of, of, of uh, knowing the results of our work. Having said that, um, let's just uh, start with the discussion and I'll pretty much introduce uh, our panelists. Um, uh, I'll first do a round of presentation of the panelists and then We'll uh, quickly uh, ask away one quick question to each one of them. Then we will enter in a little bit of a debate. And at the end, if time allows for it, we will have a little bit of Q&A. As always, it's always a good way to have your participation and to learn a little bit from also your experience, you that are joining us today. Having said that, I'll start, I'll start with one of the panelists um, with no specific order whatsoever. I would like to introduce you, Antoinette Gian. She comes and joins us from uh, Ghana, a com communications consultant with vast experience in uh, the realm of, I would say, um, health humanitarian crisis, most prominently for the work that she has been doing and conducting with UNESCO. I will also um, uh, um, introduce to you Kalai um, Maestri, um, a, a partner and per uh, customer services director of Razor PR. Of course, Razor PR, a prominent PR agency from South Africa that has been recognized quite recently as the best agency, PR agency in Africa by Provoke, um, to say the least. And of course, with extensive experience in not, not only risk prevention, but also 
uh, crisis management, and above all, reputation management. Last but not least, I would present next to me, near, <laughs> near shore, uh, Lara Popat, um, here from Maputo, uh, Mozambique, that has extensive experience in the banking industry, more than 20 years, 25 years, and in recent years has been um, uh, focusing on PR and, and uh, communications. And of course, if you look at the banking industry, a heavy regulated sector, where any risk, any reputation damage may hinder results or the way the institution itself, the company itself is perceived, then is heavily, heavily, heavily focused on risk and crisis management. Having said that, let's jump start onto the questions that are needed to be asked. And I will start with uh, you, Antoine. So if you may, I would uh, suggest, and please take this question and answer any way you want, um, could you share with us, with that vast experience that you have in terms of uh, managing and, and preparing for, um, for uh, health uh, crisis, would or could you share with us what do you think are the best tools and at which stage they should be used in order to be fully prepared? All right, thank you very much, Felipe, for that introduction. But I would say that um, my previous experience has been with UNICEF and not UNESCO, and also I've worked with Plan International in Sierra Leone and in, uh, in Ghana as well. So thank you for this invitation, and I'm excited to share with you this conversation. And of course, measurement tools um, is uh, are important ways for you to be able to a mitigate crisis. And I say that is the kind of conversation I like to have for, because when you are using rightly measurement tools, you are able to assess and identify risk. Of course, we would say that sometimes crisis just happen um, without any kind of warning. But um, when you are using measurement tools, you are even well able to prepare for those ones that you think um, just came out of the blue. So what they do for you is for you to be able to have these early warning signs and systems and also to be able to track your reputation along the way, be able to prepare for the crisis, know what communication um, strategy you would put in place in case, for example, like preempting such um, crisis for when they would come, um, looking at what scenarios you would put in place. Because really when crisis happens and um, especially health crisis, everybody is scrambling and you, you, you feel like you already have something, things change, but what helps you is that you already have prepared. You've already seen those risks and for me, I think that it makes sense for you to be able to work on those risks before they turn into a full-blown um, crisis. And when they do, you know what it is um, that you, you you want to do. So an example, an example of um, monitoring we do often is for communication people is media, media monitoring. We do a lot of media monitoring. You have, um, you have, agencies, um, tools that you can use, hootsuit, different tools that you can use. And an example is, I remember, I think in 2000, and this could be 2019, there was in Ghana, this issue of sexual reproductive health, um, there was the government's position on it. International agencies had projects that um, they were working on, on reproductive health, but there had already been a controversy around whether this should be taught in school, how it should be called, what the name is. So if you are doing proper media monitoring, you know that that is not the time for you to go and have a big campaign or launching a project or doing, because the system is antagonistic already. And so that would help you to be able to know probably have stakeholder conversations, sit with partners, decide how you go along with it. Also, when it comes to, um, for example, health, like we have drought or we have polio, all those things, we deal with communities. And sometimes you, the engagement you have with communities, you need to know um, how these communities are preparing, for example, what um, myths they are they have about these um, projects because sometimes for something as simple as uh, polio 
you would find that within the communities, there are these myths and people are not going for the vaccines and people are dying because they said, well, if you take ridiculous things, like if you take the vaccine, you, you will not go to heaven. A lot of weird things. And if you are doing um, your communication right, you would know that these are things you have to prepare for when it comes. You have to educate the relevant stakeholders, the people involved, who their community members listen to. Also, social media listening. Social media listening is important. It's extremely important um, for people to know, and even doing web analysis or lo looking at what kind of information people are searching on the website. In recent times, I have seen that um, a lot of people, and I experienced it as well with Apple, where you have this white screen deck, your phone just goes off. And so if a company is monitoring these, um, the risk, they know that, okay, this is happening. People are looking at it. Let's investigate and see what, what is really causing these kind of problems within the community. So social media listening is also um, an important um, way to also monitor your 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 work that you are doing how it's going what people are searching on your website your media monitoring etc so this is where i'll leave it with you Philippe. thank you very much Antoinette. and first of all i'm i truly apologize it's not unesco it's unicef and <laughs> it was just a, a, a sort of, of of my fun um apologies for that thank you very much for the first um uh, brief introduction onto the topic which I believe sets pretty well the tone for what tools are there available. And the fact is, of course, the tools are there and pretty much everyone that has been working or operating in this space has access to those tools one way or another. I think the difference would be how integrated they are and actually how, again, linked to the objectives at the beginning. And then how do you track the outcome of it actually make the difference. I would assume so, but I'll leave it like that. And I will um, continue with uh, uh, Kalai. And uh, if possible, Kalai, um, if we look at, uh, of course, ways of PR and from your uh, personal experience, um, you have been uh, with several companies in different sectors, different industries. I'm pretty sure that you came across some hairy problems, some um, crises uh, that had to be uh, dealt with without, even if you were prepared, things that, as Antoinette was saying, they come out of the blue, we have no way to premeditate or consider it in advance. So would you like to give us a little bit of a, of your uh, expertise on to how to handle uh, things that come out of the blue and if possible, share with us any uh, use case? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I have to agree. You know, I think listening in any way, shape or form is the best thing. It's not just, as Antoinette said, media monitoring, it's it's social listening, but it's also having that ability to just embrace the technology that's there. So I think also as PR professionals, you know, we got to see that that all the latest developments coming in is actually there to assist us. It's not, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit overwhelming sometimes and can be a bit scary, but it really is once you embrace it and you understand how it works, it really just allows you to fly and, and be a true, true advisor to your clients. So, you know, having said that, we have always at Razor, so we're quite a senior team, um, and because of that seniority, we it does give us the opportunity to set ourselves up a little bit differently from, from other agencies. And measurement for us has been key to, to everything we do within the agency. If you can't measure it, we don't want to do it. And the bottom line is the bottom line is our biggest measurement. So it's not about the awards. It's not about AVE. It's actually, can you do something constructive in the communication space to actually improve the bottom line of any of our clients that walk through our door? Because at the end of the day, that is what we are there to do. So yes, it's it's about you know awareness and 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 driving brand love and all of that stuff. But at the end of the day, it's it's a business and it's bringing in money into that business. And part of what we do, um, and the example I'd like to use is we do a lot of work with one of Africa's largest food manufacturers. And two years ago, um, out of the blue, because you can always be prepared, but sometimes, you know, preparation goes out the door when it's a last minute.com and no one's ready for it and no one saw it coming. Um, and, you know, this is what happens. So we were asked at very short notice to help with what is has been the largest recall in Southern Africa 
of a food product. So it's canned goods, food product, uh, which I think most of us have in our pantries at some point in our lives. Um, it's the Koo brand. They make a whole bunch of things in cans. Um, and in 2021, they had to recall 20 million cans from across Africa, parts of Europe, and in some countries in the um, uh, APAC region. So it wasn't as simple as one would expect. And then you add in the dynamics of, you know, Francophone Africa, Portuguese Africa, English South Africa, SADC, it, it, so it was quite a big thing and 20 million cans is not a small amount. And, you know, also considering the reputation of the corporate involved it has been a repeat offender, unfortunately, from a reputation perspective. So they're already coming with a little bit of educational, not so great, and then they have to do this recall. Um, so, you know, short, I think it broke on a over a weekend, and then Monday morning we had to hit the ground running. And this is where the advancements in, in tech combined with expertise from PR really proved its worth because we had a, a fully integrated approach. You know, it was everything from how do we take our messaging that's aligned to a call center where people are just really angry, not sure what the product is, all the way to, well, how do you reach that person sitting in London who happened to have cans that they've bought somewhere along the line and reach them, but there's no real sort of place to reach them. You have to do it via own channels. You have to do it via, you know, very targeted geoposting within that region. Um, how do you then get your supermarket shelves, for example, in Mozambique? To understand that this product is also being recalled, especially if they're not listening to radio, they're not on social media. So it was a really integrated campaign and gave you the opportunity to really go through, well, how and where are the different touch points? And, you know, and that's the wonderful thing about PR and, and this kind of opportunity, because there is opportunity when there is a crisis. It's how do you do it right? So, yes, it was quite daunting to pull out 20 million cans. But by the end of the campaign, uh, tracking it and using the tools we had became the biggest success we had because we were able to very quickly go online and say, oh, hang on a minute, this comment that went out to Mozambique, it was actually wrong because we didn't do enough of a translation job and we were actually sending the wrong message and the message landed to nobody versus quickly going online and seeing, oh, okay, in Namibia, it resonated and there it was actually more putting up pamphlets and having a person in a store to talk to consumers and have them ex explain and understand why this can needed to be recalled. Then we were also able to, for example, go online and see the comments that were coming through our social platforms. And actually one of the, the quickest problems we worked out was that we were doing such a great job, but we were actually leaving one of our key uh, stakeholders behind, the retailers, they hadn't caught up to the messaging. So you had like a little shop sitting in the middle of nowhere and that owner was completely left out of the loop. Nobody had gotten to him yet. He had no uh, tools at his disposal. He didn't know which can was being recalled. He didn't have the serial numbers. He didn't know that he was allowed to give them um, uh, uh, their funding back and that the money would be paid to him from, from the food manufacturer. So it was really just, and we wouldn't have been able to do that if it wasn't for the use of all these wonderful social listening tools that we now have. And a good old fashioned telephone, to be honest with you, because all those calls coming into the call center as well got fed back into us. So then we would know, okay, it's coming through a telephone call, but they're also seeing it on social. And then how do you amend your questions and make them a little bit more agile as you go. And then I think at the end, and you know, it was a long campaign. It, it, and you know, uh, being a very senior team, for example, at some point, even I was in charge of running the social channels. And then you also start seeing the pattern, you know, um, having the years of experience, being an ex-journalist, I sort of almost could see the stories that would be coming. And then you can also adapt um, the messaging that needed to go out to another key stakeholder who was your media. So that became very important. But at the end of this two weeks, because that was how long it took to get everyone sort of aligned and get the, I mean, it took a lot longer to get all the cans out, but to get people to understand what was truly happening. Um, we then ran 
very closed groups of one-on-one -on -one sessions with our consumer group. And the results were unbelievable. Brand trust went up by 31%. Brand equity went up by 29%. Quality perception went up by 25% and future purchase intent went up by 9%. And why the quality perception by 25% was very important, considering that we're talking about reputation and how to use tools to build and improve on that, was because the food manufacturer didn't shy away. As soon as it found the problem, it stood up and said, we have a problem this is what the problem is, this is what we're doing to fix it, and then went out and did it. And that's the thing with making a mistake, right? We're all human, we make them. But you can forgive when people stand up and say what the mistake is and then actively work to fix it. And we wouldn't have been able to do that as successfully without using the right tools and having that ability to adjust and change course as we went about. Great. That's, that's, uh, thank you very much for sharing uh, that use case. And it pretty much shows exactly how normally, and that's a, this is a, a very good example, one size doesn't fit all. So we're addressing different markets, different stakeholders, different messages, different concerns, different timings as well. And if you're not ready, as far as I understood, that, 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 that was the, how well you have, uh, the team handled the situation, if you are not ready to even to um, uh, assume and hold responsibility for what sort so all sort of tasks uh, you were referring, you were doing community management uh, alongside strategy, alongside designing and and making sure that your team had all the conditions to to do their work. At the same time, you just um, got onto hands on doing stuff. And if the teams, if I understand correctly, if the teams are not ready to do the groundwork, then they normally don't understand what needs to be to be happening at, at and in, in question so that's great that's great and at the end i loved the way you described the fact that in order to evaluate the impact of your result you actually did consumer group queries you went there to ask people's um, um uh, opinion what was their perception in terms of certain uh, of course vectors of reputation um, or live for the brand or, or um, a respect for the brand. And that pretty much ties in the whole process of, of communication. And in fact, referring the integrated evaluation framework, for example, from AMAC or the principles of Barcelona 2.0 that, of course, drive uh, forward the way uh, communication should be considered. Thank you very much, Kelly. And um, uh, moving to the third speaker, and again, uh, last but not least, Lara. Um, a pleasure. Um, and uh, one of the things after, of course, the 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 the, the share of, of of interventions of Antoinette and Calais, one of the things that uh, I believe could be uh, relevant to understand is again in a highly regulated sector like uh, the banking sector, um, of course, when you have to look into the risk management, crisis management, etc. Some of the tools are spot on and ready to use, have to be used on a regular basis, but um, there's a certain way to use them because of, of, of the sector being so highly regulated, but everyone is sharing the same space and looking at the same things. So my question to you is how those tools um, are relevant and how have them been uh, useful in, in, in your case? Thank you, Fleet, and thank you everyone here. Um, measure tools are um, very important in the, across the markets, not only in the bank sector, but in all industries. Um, when I think about that, is you are sailing a car, um, a ship in the danger sea, and you don't have compass. Measure tools is the same. They help us to guide for the right decision in the in this competition uh, market. So what these tools help us, and the risk, uh, they improve us the risk assessment. Um, when you have a tool, a right tools to support us, to improve and to, to have anticipation uh, information about the risk, they help us to make the right decision uh, in the market. 
uh, you can have uh, in our sector like cyber cigarettes. If you have information uh, in the forums, uh, in the social media about some risk that is appearing in our sector, we can produce information anticipating to the risk. And the other thing is we can anticipate and we can monitor the outcome from crisis uh, management. If you are in the middle of the crisis, um, you need to have the uh, your right decision and in the right time can make all the difference between uh, you have uh, the, um, the, uh, the problem resolved or you go to the disaster. Uh, so if you have the tools uh, that early uh, monitoring, um, early um, monitoring uh, and also a trigger, you can support you to have information that what's happening in the market, what is the journalist is publishing, what people are talking in social media, what people are talking in the forum like Telegram or WhatsApp, uh, and give us if you are prepared for this crisis. Uh, they gave us anticipating to see if the approach that you are taking now uh, are the right message that you are putting in the market. And also they help us to monitoring that uh, our uh, crisis plan is taking the result that we are expecting to. Uh, in our sector, of course, all professionals have the crisis uh, communication plan. Mm -hmm. So we know who is the person we need to spoke in, in every situation. If it's a problem with the card, it's a problem with the, um, the ATMs, uh, if it's a problem of something, imagine our head office is, is burning or something. We know is the person will be there to, to spoke and give the right information. Mm -hmm. but. Sometimes we, we, we spread the message, but the market doesn't understand the way that we want to understand. So this will help us to measure if the, our message is in the correct space and yes, spread in the correct way. Otherwise, we need to review our communication plan and make the right decision. So these tools are very, very important. And we have a lot of tools now. We have a dashboards, we have a star code, we have a KPIs. So we keep our eyes uh, on real time information. Also, they gave us a support to spot a potential problem so we can have information and prepare the approach to the market. So we have a quite a few, not just monitoring, Mm -hmm. uh, so we have uh, quite few uh, tools in the market already that support us for keeping advance and take advance and for the market. Before they starting spread for everywhere, we kept the message and we starting to make the right approach. Sure, thank you. That's it, it's 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 good to hear that um, when referring to tools um, and uh, Antoinette, Calais, and uh, Lara. You refer not only to one or two. We refer to you refer to a set of tools that you actually been used or you have been using uh, in an integrated fashion in order to get there. And I do believe, from what I heard, one of the common situations that probably occurs is whenever we have a situation of, of course, risk. But when, whenever we get to a crisis, I'm sure, pretty sure that there's a lot of panicking people running around and saying what to do now and what are we going to do and whatnot. So. Um, Whoever is dealing and handling this situation has to be quite calm tempered, I would say, because if they go along with the panic, they won't be able to sort anything. And occasionally, you need to know how to filter the noise, how to filter that first impact of, is this really impactful? Is this really having that huge impact that everyone is saying that we'll have? Or shall we address it and um, have a proper analytical way of looking into it in terms of what is the impact. And I think it's it's important to understand, and and absolutely I'm thrilled because the three of you are uh, giving us a, a showcase and showroom on how to deal with with um, with uh, risk and crisis. Now, um, having uh, put a question to each one of you, I would like us to enter a little bit of on a debate mode for the next fifteen minutes before uh, we allow for Q and A. One of the things that I would like to ask is, and um, we may start on the other way around. So first now uh, by Lara, and then again, Kalai and Antoinette, if you want to jump onto this question, please feel free. Um, when we talk about um, artificial intelligence, everyone is talking about artificial, artificial intelligence. 
Some people know what it is, some people don't know what it is, some people know how to conceptualize and materialize in terms of tools, and some others say, mm, it's out there, it's, it's out there in between us and doing stuff. Um, how do you think artificial intelligence is at the moment having an impact and will impact us in the near future? Okay. Uh, it's something that has arrived. We cannot change. <laughs> we need to know how to deal with that. Um, I think the uh, AI uh, bring us uh, a powerful uh, insights. They need to know how to work with them. We need to, work, uh, to see how we need to give the input to have the outcome that we want. But in the in the PR space and also uh, for uh, the 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 tools that we need to measure, AI comes to be this more powerful because they can help us to to treat information for other other way that the the robotic brings to uh, give us the outcome that we need. So we can make questions and they can reply us, making the monitoring all everything they have around. So in my point of view, AI comes to support us. We need to give them the right questions in the right direction, and they bring us what we want. Thank you very much. And uh, I will extend the question to Kalai and Toinette, if you like. Yeah, I think so. I think for me, it starts like with anything with 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 reputation management, right? It starts before that. So I think even with AI, what is our appetite for risk? Not just um, as agencies, but also client facing, just anyone in, in the Marcom space. How do we want to use it? What is the guidelines within which we want to use it? How much of it can we use? Because at the end of the day, speaking as a as an agency owner, you know, my client is paying me for my skills. And I'm going to farm that off to a robot to do. So, you know, there's a little bit of um, ethics that, that need to go with this. Um, it's funny enough, we've actually launched a framework for Razor. I will we'll pop a link in the chat if anyone's interested in reading that. We're going to make it available. It's open source so anyone can have access to it. So we don't want to just use AI because it's there and we know it's there. We know it's going to improve, improve what we're doing. But we want to do it once again with a clear ethics values driven way of using it so that at the end of the day, you know, if I'm doing a post for Lara, she's not going to go there and sit and to put my, my, my quote that I've sent her into a little chat box there and it puts it back out and she's like, well, I could have done this myself. Why am I paying Calais for her expertise or her writers or her creatives to do that? So I think it's finding the right use for it and doing it the right way. And that we are all clear, both clients and agencies that yes, we are using it. This is how we are using it. We're not taking your money and just giving you, you know, some substandard product. We're using it to actually rise, to raise all of our work. Um, and I think that's how, you know, I'm hoping that the industry as a whole uses it, is we use it to make ourselves better. It bec doesn't become this crutch that we rely on. Thank you. Antoinette? Yeah, I think that um, it's a it's an interesting question, and particularly for our time that we are in, and also for the submission of Lara and Kale. I I would say that AI for health, um, when you're dealing with risk in health and also in crisis, I, I have seen that it's really important and it's a good tool. Um, for example, when um, we were in COVID, we used a lot of chatbots to be able to send the right information to um, communities. And in the past, people who would not even have access to such information to be able to be well informed and to avoid death and other things, were able to do those things with AI. And also even in terms of learning um, how people within some communities were in the past cut off if they were not going to school with AI, we're able to bring um, something like learning passports or other projects where people have access because they have these tools. Even with farmers, we have these um, radios, um, I forgot what they're called now, but these small tools that share information with them, which season they are in and all that. So we just have to know 
um, in what ways does this um, AI come to augment what work that we are doing? And of course, it has the downside and also we also have to keep an eye on it as PR professionals and people who are working in communication in general. But from my standpoint, I often say that I see that it's more of a tool that is aiding us in the work that we are doing. When used properly, it helps to save time, it helps to save lives, it helps to um, bring a lot of um, development. And so it's, it's been a good tool to, to say. Sure, sure. And I, I, I yeah, I, I completely, completely, um, whatever, what you said completely resonates with my thinking, even because I don't think I, um, and I, a lot of people is a little bit afraid of what AI will do and if uh, we'll replace um, several uh, uh, tasks that normally uh, a PR a professional would do. But I would say that, yes, it, it's there to help us, but uh, as as Lara was saying, it becomes it, it makes the tools more powerful. So the the real time monitoring in terms of filtering, the entity tagging and segmentation, and re entity um, uh, or relating entities, either, either, whether uh, would it be names or or places, or it it just makes it more uh, quicker, um, agile, and actually a better tool to be used if we know how to use them. Now, that brings. To my next question, and I would start with you, Kalei, if you don't mind, which uh, uh, refers to maturity, the state of maturity in which um, the the industry is, the PR and communication industry is. So we have, of course, several um, uh, senior. The seniority is not in question. The experience is not in question. The, the the question that I that I that I make, and I'm not of course criticizing, is do we have the level of maturity, public discussion and maturity within the communication and PR professionals industry to allow us to discuss on the same level? I'm I'm referring to this because if we again talk again uh, about the study of um, PRCA and, and APRA um, about the, the ethics, the status of ethics and, and public relations, it's easier to understand that. A, a, a considerable chunk of uh, PR professionals are still pretty much doing things as probably they were doing 10 years, 15 years, 20 years ago. So my question to you, are we in the status of um, embracing uh, the technology, the, the, the methodologies, the way we, 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 should, we should do it? I think yes and no, right? And I think, you know, to your point, different markets are at different stages of, of maturity. There's different client needs, there's different agency needs. So, so it does vary. I think on the whole, this is where the power of the collective becomes really important. It's having these debates, it's having these webinars, it's being a member of associations uh, like the PRCA. It's listening, it's reading, it's being informed. And a lot of it is actually down to, to you know, both sides of the coin, the client and the agencies is, here is this new technology. What is my responsibility around it? How can I use it to improve uh, myself firstly? How do I use it to improve the bigger industry? How do I use it to benefit, whether it's my client or whether it's my business, um, and and so I think it does start with that, but it's not going to be this journey where we do it on our own. Um, and I think if anything, you know, the more you see it being used successfully and within within reason, and you know, not doing anything in 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 sort of a dodgy way, where it's not, you know, we're using it on the side, we're just not telling people about it. Where you're upfront about it, and I think that's that's the way it goes. And I mean, you know, we've seen this, for example, during COVID. <laughs> We saw people talking about all the disinformation around the vaccines and and all of that, and then you you know you you thought well actually you know it's it's going to be pretty similar. It's this new thing coming in. How do we address the misinformation? How do we create enough awareness that people can stand up and say, oh, is that what a chatbot does? Oh, is that what ChatGPT does? This is how it can be used. This may be not how it should be used, and we don't want to, you know, use it that way in our organization. So I think it has to be this collective journey that we all go on. I think some people will embrace it a lot faster 
But I think my advice to anyone that's that's sort of in this space is to embrace it. You know, try it out. It's it's scary for all of us to try something. You nobody know, likes change, let's be honest. But at the end of the day, it's going to make you a better person. It's going to help your bottom line. And it's going to create great work. And I think let's not forget that, right? We all want to do our best every day, you know, whether it's coming up with the most creative campaign, whether it's delivering really successful, successful issues management campaign, it can be anything, you know, we just want to do our best and, and this will help us get there. And yeah, I'm hoping as a collective, we can drag everyone forward with us. Wonderful, wonderful, <laughs> wonderful answer. Thank you very much. Antoinette, would you like to add? Yes, I would agree with Kali to say that um, it's in these dialogues and also the power of the collective. What also sometimes happens is that PR professionals um, work within a certain context and a certain framework. Um, if you are in an agency, it's different because then most of you understand what the, the direction is and what you're going to do. But if you are working within um, a bigger framework and you have uh, people who have a misunderstanding of what PR is supposed to mean and what communication is. Some time ago when um, people talked about PR in Ghana and other places, they thought it was the Aaron board. And it would, so um, with the kind of education and like people have a certain idea of what you're supposed to do, what the work should look like and all that. And so um, agencies and bodies and associations like APRA and PRCA and IPR Ghana and all those um, platforms, um, trying to, first of all, even educate these professionals about what their role is supposed to be. And so then they are able to show forth and have people coming along um, with them, but it might take time. But I think that we've made a lot of progress um, within the PR space and definitely these AI tools and new technologies um, are showing us how things um, can improve. And I think I also agree with the point of saying that when we see it done um, for a long period and with consistency, we would get people along with us. And so that's what I would say. Thank you very much. And Frenette, I don't know if you want to. Yes, I agree with uh, Kalai, uh, but is uh, I think the maturity uh, from the PR is depending on uh, the market uh, you are on. So you have market more mature, so your PR uh, on the market is more mature also because they need to lead with the cries every moment and every day. So um, wh when you are in the community and also for us like a client, we have and we expect our PR agency to support us. So we expect that they are more mature than us they, so they can guide us. So when you have also... Um, I think we are uh, making an evolution. Our market is not an like example. Mozambique market is, uh, we, we, we change the ideas, like we don't have time to mature about one news that is coming uh, because otherwise it's coming the next news. So imagine you are in the middle of the crisis. If you launch a new campaign, oh, people that doesn't remember what you published yesterday. We have a new thing to, to make a buzz in the, in the market, but it's a different market. Maybe United States or in Europe, people are more uh, aware about what's happening around. So people is not a uh, consumer now and uh, early. Uh, so I think it's depending on the market about how in the stage the PR are. Of course. No, no, absolutely. And, and I, would, I would just add one, one little thing, which is, um, of course, my question uh, was um, directed and focused on the PR professionals and communication professionals. But we need to bear in mind that PR professionals and communication professionals normally tend to answer uh, to administrations, CEOs, etc. And the level of maturity that is also on that level also um, tends to shift quite uh, a lot when it comes to big companies, medium companies, small companies, uh, industry sectors, etc. And that, uh, that, of course, even if the level of maturity of the PR professional is the highest, um, occasionally, more often than not, is limited to the extent of uh, the work that they can uh, do or anything uh, different that they may want to, to implement. Now, we are pretty much on the 
45 minutes mark. So uh, this would be the right time to accept questions for the Q&A session, 15 minutes. I would ask if anyone in the room has a question that they would like to pose. Um, at the same time, Joe, um, Joe from PRC Africa, Joe Brophy, she's on the other end of the streaming. Uh, my my companion in terms of management this of managing this 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 webinar. Now that that's Joe. Hello, Joe. Welcome. Uh, Thank you. If if there are any questions um, that someone would like to pose, we haven't had any questions uh, live yet. So if people have any questions, do feel free to use the Q and A box. Okay. Thank you very much. Then and until a question pops up. I will continue with my questions that I have a list of questions to, to post. So uh, going back to tools and methodologies, um, the, the measurement tools and methodologies that are used on a regular basis. Now, my question, my question would be, how integrated are they? Because those tools and methodologies, we may talk about scorecards and risk matrix, et cetera. They may sit on an Excel file. They may sit on a on a tool that does all the monitoring, they may sit on uh, uh, several different providers. And whenever you have different tools, different systems, different formats, you do need to integrate them. And most, I would say, one of the most ch the challenging uh, bits would be to harmonize the way the data is structured and connects to each other. So my question to you, to any that would like to start answering, are there any perfect systems 100% spot on that we can use from tomorrow onwards? Or is this a progress that we need to, of course, understand and try out and understand more than the systems and the tools, the people that are behind it? Because there are, those are the ones that will actually do the journey with us to support us in finding the right way. So that's an open question to whoever may want to answer. I think it's always people first. <laughs> it's always the people, the level of skill first, over and above everything else. Um, and then comes the tools. But again, the tools are like people. None of us are the same. Uh, you know, we all have our weaknesses. We all have our strengths. I think it's just finding what works for what you want to do. And I know, you know, and I, and I think we talked about markets being different. And I don't want people to go away thinking, oh, they're just you know, can say this because they have like great clients and we have access to all these fancy gadgets. Sometimes you don't even need that fancy gadget really at the end of the day. You know, I remember when we first started Razor and, you know, we started this during COVID with no clients, no offices, no people. It was literally just the, the managing partner. And as we slowly started building it out, we, we literally had no tools, but I had to very quickly do a reputation analysis for a client um, and, you know, it was as basic as creating a Google Word document with some questions that I wanted and emailing it out anonymously to a bunch of pre-selected journalists. And that was what I used to pull together my report. It was so successful because it was like, I think the first time anyone had gone to a tier one group of media and asked them anything about this brand. They were so excited to talk. And the fact that it was anonymous gave them even more impetus to tell the truth. So I think let's not be overwhelmed as well by all the tech. It's sometimes it's as basic as that. It's having the right people do the right thing. But no, um, I mean, even today we have access to all these tools, but it isn't, it isn't easy. You have to find the right people. Uh, you know, who does it sit with? Does it sit, for example, with just the team that works on issues and crisis comms? Does it sit with, um, again, so we're lucky in that we have spent a lot of uh, resources setting up a data analysis team. So we have them. Does it sit with them? Um, so it's just finding a fit that works for you and finding the fit that works for that particular issue or crisis that you're managing at that time. Great, great. Antoinette, uh, Lara, you want to add something? Yes, I would say that um, just like um, integrated uh, PR, our approach to, to that, we would look at um, all of this, these tools as not 
the perfect too because contexts are different, scenarios are different, issues are different. And so even with the work that we do, we know that we rely on different um, individuals, different sectors, different partners to be able to gather information. And in the same light, we would say that these tools that we use, um, for example, one may be able to show us strengths, and that's fine, but that is giving you the information to be able to go on and build on to something else. So probably we can't just mention one to say, go and use um, a chatbot and that is your savior or go and use another thing and then um, go and use Hootsuite or web analytics or another tool that would give you everything. In fact, you would give the information, you will get the information by your ability to interpret it and be able to use it in in the context within that context is what will probably make the, the the most difference and so that is what i would say these um tools are to inform you to give you information and to help you to be able to make data driven um decisions and so we always have to look for ways to be able to take one information make meaning build on that to to be able to make other decisions as we go along Thank you very much, Antoinette. I would just hold your um, input onto this question because I do believe that we have a question on, on online. We do indeed, and I think this might have been touched on already. And um, how many monitoring? Uh, how can monitoring tools help identify potential PR crises before they escalate? Right. Thank you very much, Jill. I don't think the question was particularly directed to anyone. So I would again open the floor. Who would like to address? Okay. Can you formulate the question? The question is how uh, the, the, the measurement tools can support in identifying um, risk scenarios and preventing those, helping prevent, okay. to prevent those. I can sure. uh, jump in. Okay. So, um, you have different tools. You have a, uh, you have one tool is an early uh, warning um, system and also um, the triggers. So these uh, tools give you ends up when with the key, uh, the right keywords to prevent uh, some uh, risk is appear. So if they uh, show up you the risk, you can measure the risk, you can monitor it and give you time to bring the right message to the to the market. So it's depending a lot of the risk, uh, the, the the risk that you have in your uh, in your sector. I don't know the the person is different sector in in the market, but this is one of the tools that can support us to identify and monitor the risk in the market. How they help? They bring us uh, hands up before the crisis is installed. Sure, sure. Thank you, Lara. Um, Kalai, Antoinette, would you like to add? Yeah, I think, you know, using the media monitoring tools also gives you, it preempts. So it's even before the risks, maybe it's not even a subject we thought about, <laughs> you know, it could be anything because you're hearing directly from your consumers or you're hearing not necessarily directly from your consumers. It's somebody else talking about your product. Maybe they hate your product, but they don't actually use your product. So it just gives you a different opportunity to go in there once again. So it's not always necessarily flagging a risk that you already noticed. And I think one of the important things about social listening is not only does it give you a flag of what's to come or what are the topics are, it also actually shows you who the actual person is that's owning that conversation about your brand. You know, you could think it's Kale because she's loud and she talks a lot. <laughs> Meanwhile, you know, it's someone further down her chain, she's just regurgitating whatever she's seeing or reposting stuff from somebody else. And it's actually that author or that content creator that actually is the owner of that topic and is the one that is driving it. So it also allows you to go and say, Lara, I think you have a problem with me. How can we help you? Do we take it offline? Do we DM you directly? Or are you just saying this because you're just one of those unhappy people hoping to get a voucher out of me at the end of the day if you complain enough? So it also gives you that flexibility to make a direct intervention into uh, someone who actually is the root of that issue or, or is the one that actually needs you to, to give them a little bit of brand love, maybe. Sure, great, thanks. And again, Antoinette. 
Yes. yes. Um, so when Kalio was talking, it reminded me of agenda setting. And um, I think uh, it's important that, like, yeah, sometimes that people are really setting those agenda. And and these are also things that we shouldn't um, actually ignore because it might start off um, like a small fire. And then before you know it, it's a big thing. So it's actually good to, to address it. But um, more so when it comes to actually measuring tools, measurement tools, they can do a lot of things. So when you are doing this, um, looking at the sentiments, what people are saying within the media space, also tracking these and for example, even doing a communication audit or even feedback form, a simple feedback form for, it might bring up something that um, you didn't even know um, existed with regards to the service that you are providing or the product. So even sometimes just routine customer feedback forms can pop up something, they may say something is a bit, and then whilst you actually investigate, you might see that there's something there and you'll be able to mitigate it. And so measurement tools uh, really are important. They help in terms of um, reputation, most importantly, because it, it helps a lot with what people perceive about your product and it goes a long way to affect your bottom line. So that aspect, it really helps. There are these tools available, social media, as we said earlier, media mentions, all those things are two things that we need to pay attention to. Sometimes when it comes to the work that we do in PR, it seems like maybe um, we are always in motion and trying to do the next thing, but it's always important to take time to actually track what you are doing, actually monitor um, what you're doing, get some information from your um, audiences, your customers, people that you're providing service for, because it might lead to some things. Thank you very much, Antoinette. We're pretty much reaching the end of this session. And again, one hour just flies by without um, uh, one noticing it. I'll just a little last shout, uh, uh, shout out to the huge, overwhelming crowd that we have here present. If there are any questions that we'd like to, to put, if no, I believe online we don't have um, any other questions as well. So, uh, Joe? No. No, exactly. Okay. So thank you very much. Then I would go for a last 30 seconds before wrapping up. 30 seconds to each one of you. Um, if you may, or if you want, and if you think uh, there's nothing else to add, please uh, say so. Uh, in terms of uh, how can those that are just starting or struggling to find where uh, to get to know more information about it, what would you suggest? I think pretty much we've discussed this already, but in a nutshell, in 30 seconds, I would start with you, uh, Antoinette, please. Um, how would you say in 30 seconds, how would you support your fellow colleagues? I would say keep it simple. Um, keep it simple because um, there's always a starting point. And if um, we should know that these measurement tools are available to us, for example, if you use a simple website, you have the opportunity to go on the back end to see um, what information is there. That is data. You know who is actually um, patronizing your service or who is actually visiting your site. You have social media, you, you can hire a simple agency, they can track what people are saying. You can use a simple form to get information. And so these measurement tools are available um, to us. And I know that budget is often um, an issue, but PR people often need to make a case within whatever context they work in about what is important, um, what that can help in the work and you need to show, show show working for that and be able to do that because it's part of your work. And when crisis happens, you will find the money. So you always have to actually make a case for um, actually identifying the risk with these measurement tools that are available to us. Thank you very much, Antoinette. I love the passion that you have because those were the longest 30 seconds I ever seen. So thank you very much. <laughs> Just kidding. Thank you very much. Lara, would you sum it up in 30 seconds? Okay. I think uh, if I have advice is uh, keep it simple, like uh, uh, Antonio had said, but is more important is know your market. And, and if you choose the partner to support you, uh, choose a partner that know your market and uh, can uh, give him all the insight you need and know the keywords that you need to monitor in your market and the partner will, will support you. Wonderful. 
And Stella, your 30 seconds, please. Sure. I think knowledge is power. Learn as much as you can, from whom you can, wherever you can. Whether it's webinars, going onto websites, asking someone. I mean, how did we ever forget that? Find a mentor and just try it. And like Antoinette and Laura said, keep it simple. You know, start basic, but go into it with some curiosity and an open mind. And be a sponge. Absorb all you can. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We reached the mark, so I, I would uh, lastly just thank everyone here in the room, everyone online that joined us. Um, of course, uh, thanking Lara for joining us here live. Thank you, uh, thank you, Antoinette. Thank you, Kalai. Um, I would lastly thank Joe on the other end of the streaming. Uh, without her, this couldn't be possible. Thank you to the RCA for the partnership involved. And I hope that this session has been at least useful to, if not illustrate or, or raise a couple of issues or a couple of points of view that you haven't been across before, at least to support, to uh, strengthen them, as in to uh, reiterate the importance of some of the things that you already know, but yet that you haven't been systematizing or looking at it because occasionally we don't have even time to think about things. So I hope this has been useful and I hope to see you quite soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.